Okay, thank you. Can you hear me well? Okay, now. <laughs> Great. Yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Irene Schoss. I'm head of product at CDBits. And at CDBits, we are on a mission to help decision makers take decisions based on crowd intelligence. But today, I also want to talk here on handling AI bias and lack of representativity in our data. And to start, I would like to play a game with you. I would like you to imagine a CEO. What comes to your mind? Who comes to your mind when you imagine a CEO? And when you imagine a nurse? And who comes to your mind when you imagine someone that is going to pick their kids to school and needs to leave early? So were you thinking of a man when we were talking about the CEO? Were you thinking of a woman when we were talking about the nurse? Were you thinking of a mother when we're th the person that goes to pick up their kids? So we as humans are biased, and our bias are inherently with us. They come of the way that they have educated us. They come of the way that we interact with people. And it's fine, not all bias are bad. But the thing is that I also try to play this game with Dali. I don't know if you know Dali. Dali is a, an AI system that you can type any kind of text, and it returns you, it generates some images. So for example, if I'm trying to type mm, a city full of skyscrapers, it will generate images of cities similar to New York or Tokyo. So when I was trying to play this game, I wrote CEO, and those are the images that I was getting. So all male, all white, I don't see diversity here. So let's see what happens when we type nurse. OK, we see the woman now. So we are bringing all our biases as humans into our technology. And this needs to be noted. We need to understand why this is happening. Because when I started into technology, I thought algorithms were objective, that they were going to help us. But we see that it's not true. So I'm not sure if, no, the video is going, works. Well, I can explain it. <laughs> um, this is a video that I really like by Kathy O'Neill, that she's trying to explain why the algorithms are not objective. So basically, when we talk about an algorithm, we talk about two things. We have historical data. We need to feed the algorithm with data. And we also define, for example, if I'm the data science, if I'm the developer, I'm defining a definition of success of this algorithm. So to put a really easy example, for example, if tonight I have some friends coming to my home and we are, I'm going to cook pizza for them, I can define the definition of success. And maybe my defini definition of success is that we all have different pizzas, that we, mm, yeah, that, that they are well cooked and so on. But my friend that is vegan, they will, um, he or she won't have like, the same definition of success. Maybe their definition of success is that the pizzas don't have meat, they don't have cheese. Mm, but also my Italian friend will have a, a different definition of success. So we as humans think differently, and that's good. But we need to take that into account. And every time that we are building our algorithms, we are bringing our definitions of success into them. Also, when we are building our algorithms, we're using training data. We feed our algorithms with lots of data. And this data is data that we can find, for example, available in the internet. So when mm, people from OpenAI are training DALI, what they are doing is they are collecting all the images that we can find in the internet. And it's normal that most of those images, they are CEO, like when we mm, see images of CEOs, they are men, they are white, because that's what's happening nowadays. The problem is that we are training our algorithms with the data that has biases. And the algorithms are multiplying these, those biases. So when I train my algorithm, I'm adding all this data that is over-representing or under-representing certain um, population. I'm creating my model, I'm validating my model, and I'm adding my definition of success. So when we say an algorithm will help us, yes, of course, they will help us. We as CDBits, we use AI. 
But we need to understand that they have biases and we need to be aware of that. So, okay, yeah, I've, we've talked about biases, we've talked about what are the main problems that we see in terms of artificial intelligence or technology in general, but also there's another thing, that we live in a data explosion. Every day we're generating lots of data. 90% of the data has been generated in the last few years. Each of us is generating 50 gigas of data every month. And the thing is that 80% of this data is unstructured. So this means that it's not easily processed by a machine. So what I mean with unstructured, it can be videos, it can be pictures, it can be text. We are all generating this data every day. And within those data, there's lots of data of us expressing our needs. I can express what worries me online. I can express what do I need. I can express what kind of questions do I have. So policymakers and decision makers need to process, understand all this unstructured data that we are publishing online or that we are, um, even when we are talking to our friends and so on, because people want to be heard and people want that governments and big organizations take decisions based on what we really need, not on what they think is better for us. So this is what CTVIT solves. What we do is we collect more than one million mm, different data sources. It can be mm, Twitter, Facebook public pages, mm, blogs, or um, mm, any kind of online data that you can publish that is open. Then also we create these on-demand surveys, which, is, which are surveys that arrive to you uh, on, by SMS in order to arrive to people that has not, no access to the internet. And we collect and analyze what do people need, what are their main concerns. We collect all, all this huge amount of data and we train it with our NLP and machine learning algorithms. This is the key point. This is where we don't want to be biased because if we need to give actionable insights to decision makers that then will mm, take decisions based on what are our needs. We don't want to leave anyone behind. So for example, if our algorithms, they don't work for any language, then we would be leaving a part of the population behind. If our algorithms, they only work for proper English, we would be leaving people that cannot speak proper, that don't have education, that they cannot speak proper English behind. So, that's why we think mm, being diverse, being inclusive, and being aware of the bias that your algorithm has is super important. And the thing is that, going back to this mm, bias problem, it's really difficult for me, if I'm the one building the algorithm, to put myself in the other shoes. It's, as we said, that this definition of success, even if we know that everyone can have different definitions of success, it's very difficult for me to even if I'm an empathetic person, to try to think on what's everyone thinking and if my algorithms is being inclusive for everyone. So well, at the end, what we provide are actionable insights for decision makers can uh, make their decisions based on that. And you might be asking, okay, what do you mean by insights? So this is our solution and our solution answers questions like, how is migration pol polarizing public opinion? How do people feel about crime in Latin America? How do people feel about climate change in Europe? So you come with this question in mind and you can understand the narratives behind that. You can understand what kind of anom anomalies are, mm, are emerging based on unusual changes on the conversation. You can detect, well, the biases in the data you can also detect some social indexes, like for example, is the conversation polarized? Are people like talking a lot about one topic and someone totally different? And what's the perception of inflation? What's the level of distrust or civic unrest in our society? So, yeah, to explain it a bit better, I will give you a couple of examples. Mm. One of the things that we have is the social risk monitor, that the goal is to contribute to reduce inequality and poverty 
promoting poverty and innovation. So this social risk monitor is being used by big multilateral organizations like, for example, World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, United Nations Development Program, in order for them to prioritize what are the main citizen needs. So this monitor is available in more than 70 countries and in any language, so they can take their decisions based on that. So for example, we have different categories like education, food insecurity, access to water and sanitation, transport and mobility. So, for example, people can find here that some specific region or there is some specific region in Colombia that mm, the difference between the perception of inflation and the real number of inflation is a bit different. And you can see how they correlate over time and also understand the specific narratives. For example, one of the things that we found was that there were farmers in Colombia that needing to sell their chickens. They had an Mm, an egg farm, but they needed to sell their chickens because they didn't have money to buy the food for them. So those are the kind of insights that allow you to take better decisions and decide where to invest the, your money. Also, for example, we've been working with World Health, World Health Organization with the EARS monitor, where we created a platform to monitor infodemic and misinformation around COVID-19 and vaccines. Because when the COVID-19 pandemic started, there wasn't only like a health pandemic, we also have an infodemic. This means a pandemia of information. We have lots of information. There was lots of people posting in Twitter, Facebook, any kind of social network, what they think about can solve COVID, what they thought about the vaccines, what they thought about everything. So this allowed WHO to create better and more specific communication campaigns that were solving this misinformation. For example, there were people in Kenya saying that, well, um, women saying that they didn't want to get vaccinated because they thought that if they got vaccinated, then they wouldn't be able to get pregnant. Or also in lots of Africa, African countries, they were saying that the vaccines they were receiving were the ones expired from Europe. So all this, knowing all this kind of information allows you to get and act in a more mm, specific way. Um, also, for example, we have uh, another monitor for Jamaica that it allows you to, to know, mm, to understand the digital skills of the people. So on one side, you can understand mm, what young people want to study, and on the other side, what, job, what kind of job offers are there in the country and in the nearby countries. So this has allowed them to better plan and define their education for the next year. So here at City Beats, we are building technology to fairly represent the global population by empowering their voices. And as I said, we cannot go alone. We cannot create models on our side if we want to be representative and inclusive and without bias. And this is why we created the Ethical AI community. This is a community that we launched last week where everyone is involved. And one of the things that we're going to do is to open our models. So any of our mm, artificial intelligence and machine learning models will be open so anyone can try them, test them, challenge them. So we know that they are representing the whole population. And well, this is all and thank you very much. <laughs>